Okay, so we're going to be talking about calorimetry in this particular slide. And first thing we're going to do is let's identify what calorimetry is. So calorimetry is a science of measuring heat. It's based on observing the temperature change when a body absorbs or releases energy as heat. So the main thing here is understanding what calorimetry is and how we're going to apply it. So what is it? It's the science of measuring heat. So how are we going to apply it? Now, before we get to that question, let's talk about substances. Substances respond differently to being heat and acquire their own specific heat slash heat capacity. So what exactly is heat capacity? Heat capacity is the amount of heat that a substance will absorb before it starts to change temperature. So what exactly does that mean? All right, we, if we talk about water, for example, water has its own unique heat capacity. It also has its own specific heat. Specific heat and heat capacity are, are two different things. So the heat capacity really is a reflection of how much substance is there. So if you talk about a pot of water, so let's say we, let's say we take a small pot of water versus a, a large pot of water. Which one is going to heat up quicker? Which one has a higher heat capacity? Well, the smaller pot of water definitely is going to heat up faster than the, the larger pot of water. So we would say that the larger pot of water has a higher heat capacity. So and just to give you a definition, heat capacity is the amount of heat absorbed before an increase in temperature is observed. So as we were talking about water, so let's say we have the mass. So which will have a higher heat capacity, 10 grams or 100 grams of water? Well, which one's going to take longer to heat up? Obviously, the 100 grams is going to be the one that has a longer wait time before it heats up. So the 100 grams of water is going to have a higher heat capacity. Now, as we talk about specific heat, specific heat is dependent on the substance, but not how much substance is present. So it's not like heat capacity where it, it was dependent on the amount of substance present. This one, no matter how much substance you have present, the specific heat will always stay the same. So if you have 10 grams of water versus 100 grams of water, the heat capacity is always going to be the same value. And that's just a little bit different than what we saw in that previous example. So, water has a specific heat of 4.8 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And that is liquid water. So, this is a constant, this is a specific heat that you want to remember and, and keep with you because it's something that we're going to utilize. So, now, there are other specific heats out there, and if we talk about them specifically, let's talk about aluminum, for example. So, aluminum, does it take much heat to heat up aluminum? And if it does get heated up, does it cool down quickly? Yes, aluminum is a very interesting metal because if you put aluminum full in, a, in an oven, and you go to pull the full back out, you don't have to have the oven mitts on. You can just grab the aluminum foil and take it right out and set it on the table. You're done. Uh, so aluminum foil has a very low specific heat in relation to that of water. In fact, aluminum has a specific heat of 0 0.89 joules per gram degrees Celsius. So it has a really relatively low specific heat. So now let's talk about iron versus water. Which one heat up quickest, iron or water? Well, which one has the higher specific heat? Which one has the lower specific heat? So iron has a specific heat up, and you can look these values up in your textbook or an online source. It's 0.45 joules per gram per degree Celsius. Whereas water has a specific heat of 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. 
so we would expect the iron to heat up much quicker. Take a piece of iron that doesn't have any plastic on it or any anything surrounding it protective and hold it in the fireplace. See how long you hold it up. You're not going to hold it very long because you're going to drop it like it's hot. Because it is hot. Water, for example, it takes a much longer time to, for water to warm up in comparison to iron. And it takes a much longer time for water to cool down than, than iron does. Because iron specific heat is much lower than that of water. So water is sort of your, your standard there. And it's water, this specific heat is 4.18. So I want to share this with you just while I'm thinking about it. Water solid. Now this is water liquid here. All right. Water solid does have a lower specific heat. And that's 2.03 joules per gram times degrees Celsius. So it does have a lower specific heat and, and it, it heats up a little bit quicker and it also melts pretty quickly, but that's because of something different. We're not going to talk about that today. But for right now, just understand that that water specific heat, liquid water, is 4.8 joules per gram degree Celsius. Iron, most metals are going to be lower than that to begin with. Metals heat up quickly and they cool off quickly. Why do we use aluminum in our cars and motors and, and other sources? Because it can withstand the heat. We put aluminum radiators in our car so that way it pulls the heat out quickly so that, we'll, so that the motor has a better chance of surviving a long haul if you want to drive a long distance. Or even a race car for that matter. Race cars use aluminum radiators because it dissipates heat so quickly. So when we move on to the heat equation, heat equation, there are two different types of equations that involve using the heat equation. Uh, the first one is using coffee cup calorimetry, and the second one is called bond calorimetry. We're going to get to bond calorimetry here in just a short bit, but for right now, let's talk about coffee cup calorimetry. Coffee cup calorimetry utilizes this equation here, which is called the heat equation. Q is equal to mass times specific heat times delta T. Specific heat of a substance, it, again, is depending on that substance that you're looking at. The mass is depending on what's there in front of you. So, and then delta T is obviously the measurement of, of the change of temperature. Delta T is T final minus T initial. So, we're going to look at this example here where we have 3.15 grams of barium hydroxide added to a solution of 1.52 grams of NH4SCN, that's ammonium thiocyanate, and 100 grams of water. All this is put into a calorimeter and it causes the temperature to drop by 3.1 degrees Celsius. So we're going to assume that specifically the solution product is 4.2 joules per gram degree Celsius, pretty much specifically the water. We're going to calculate the amount of heat absorbed by the reaction, and the reaction is shown below. So, first thing we need to do is we need to figure out the mass of the solution. So, the mass of the solution is going to, where we're going to take uh, 3.15 grams, we're going to add that to 1.52 grams, and we're going to add that to 100 grams of water. And we will end up with 104.67 grams of solution. So now we're going to go and use that and solve for Q. So we know the mass. We know the mass solution is 104.67 grams. Then we're going to use the specific heat, which is 4.20 joules per gram degrees Celsius, and then our delta T here was 3.1 degrees Celsius. And so since it dropped, we're going to represent that by a negative sign here. All right, so put that in your calculator and plug away. We end up with negative 1,362.8 Here, grams is going to go away. 
your Celsius is going to go away. So that's going to be left with joules. All right, I'm going to go ahead and convert this into kilojoules. Uh, no specific reason other than the fact that I like to use kilojoules. You'll see delta H being used in kilojoules pretty much in everything. That's negative 0.136 kilojoules. Okay, so what is the enthalpy reaction when we have 3.15 grams of ammonium thiocyanate? So we so we have 3.15 grams of NH4SCN. So first thing we do is, is like earlier, we're going to convert that into moles. The molar mass of this substance is 76. 0.1 grams per mole. Right, grams are away. And that gives you 0 0.0414 moles. So now we're going to solve for delta H for this process. So we're going to take the value we just determined up here. Now I want to make a comment here in that we have to understand that whether this is endothermic or exothermic, since it said that the temperature dropped, so the temperature fell. That means that we're dealing with endothermic, so you cannot use the negative sign that you saw for Q here. Your it's going to be positive for delta H because it's endothermic. Keep that straight. Always make sure you determine whether it's endothermic or exothermic. So this is positive. All right, so we've got positive 1.36 kilojoules divided by the 0.0414 moles. 1.36 divided by 0 0.04. 4 gives me 32.9. This 32.9 kilojoules per mole. And this is positive because it's endothermic. So that's the amount of energy that would be absorbed if we had that many grams of ammonium thiocyanate yet. All right, bomb calorimeter is a little bit easier. This is going to be utilizing the equation of Q is equal to C cal times delta T. All right, C cal is the heat capacity calorimeter. You would you have to measure this to, to determine that value or it would be given to you in the problem. Delta T again is the change in temperature where you have T final minus T initial. So if we have 5.14 grams of biphenyl undergoing combustion in a bog calorie the temperature rose from 25.8 to 29.4 degrees Celsius. Determine the enthalpy of reaction. The heat capacity calorimeter is measured to be this. So Q is equal to the heat capacity, which is 5.86 kilojoules per degree Celsius. We're going to multiply that by the change in temperature here. All right, the change in temperature is going to be 29.4 minus 25.8. That gives me 3.6 degrees Celsius. So we're going to take the 5.6 and multiply by 3.6. That gives me 21.1 kilojoules of energy that, that was absorbed by the solution here. So the temperature did go, did go up, so this would be exothermic, and that's why I say the energy would travel all into the solution. This stir would stir the solution, and you would see the temperature go up in this in the thermometer here. All right, this is an illustration of a calorimeter, a bomb calorimeter on the right hand side. So, last thing we want to do here is we want to figure out the the delta H for this particular reaction. So what you would need to do is you would want to convert uh, your grams of biphenyl into moles of biphenyl. All right, biphenyl has a molar mass of 154 grams. So take the 5.14 divided by 154. That gives you 0 0.0334 moles. So to solve for delta H, since we're dealing with a negative uh, an exothermic process, this is going to be negative 21.1 kilojoules per 0 0.0334 moles, and that gives you 631.7.
kilojoule. When you take the negative 21.1 divided by 0 0.0334 moles, you end up with 631.7 kilojoules per mole of biphenyl. Now, this should be negative sign because, again, the reaction was exothermic because it went from 25.8 to 29.4. So, as we talk about a bond polymer, I want to just, just explain the, the illustration over here on the right. So, what happens here is you put a little sample of substance in this container here. You have electrodes going into that sample. They apply some energy and they cause this combustion to take place. If there's any energy that's released, it's going to be input into the water that's surrounding it. And this is a closed container. It does not change volume. So we don't have to worry about volume here. Only thing that's going to change is the amount of temperature of the water. And that could either go up or down depending on the type of reaction. In this case here, it, it's most of the time going to be combustion reaction. So this little spinner here is spins, and this is what circulates the water and allows for the thermometer to get a very accurate reading of the temperature that takes place as the combustion happens. So this is just an example of a bob cylinder, and it is a sample problem that illustrates you know how we utilize the heat equation for both bottom calorimeter and coffee cup calorimeter. The difference is a bottom calorimeter is constant volume, whereas a coffee cup calorimeter is constant pressure. It's open to the atmosphere. So I hope this. I hope you get something from this video. Thanks for watching.